Hello everyone, I hope you are well, playing and making the games that you all love. You're joining me, your host, Max Pears, but not just me, we're joined by a lovely, phenomenal, and all-around great guy, Mr. Ross Wilding, lead level designer on Squadron 42. How are you doing, sir? I'm good, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. No worries, mate. We've been planning this for a while now, and then the stars aligned, and we're finally here, mate. Yep, it's good to be here. For sure, man. And so, for those who may not know a bit about you, do you mind giving a bit of a a backstory on who you are and how you got into games, mate? But first, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is none other than me. What I've done, everyone, and I hope you're excited for this, is I've actually created a level design kind of store. What I've done in this store is put up different kinds of tips and tricks that you can find there, whether that be my actual ebook itself to that of level design pamphlets focused on different things such as traversal, stealth, breaking into the industry, as well as different talks that I have done which you cannot find anywhere else other than on this store. So if you are looking to improve on your level design skills and processes, then check out the level design store, which will be down in the description below where there'll be a link to find this. All you need to do is head over to gumroad.com forward slash level design lobby. I hope you like what you see and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. And now back to the show. Sure. So um, I've, Basically, it sounds scary when I say this, but I'm c- coming up to 15 years and working in games, um, wow, which is getting close to half my life. So it's uh, <laughs> pretty scary. But um, so I'll, I'll kind of touch on my kind of pre, you know, game dev days uh, in a second. But um, outside of kind of doing like a summer QA job uh, at a mobile studio, I actually started out at uh, Traveller's Tales. So um I worked there for several years on a number of the, the Lego games. I think the one I'm most kind of uh, passionate about, and if anyone kind of knows me, they'll know I talk most about, is uh, Lego City, uh, Lego City Undercover. Um, so like I said, I worked there for several years, and then I basically moved over to Deep Silver Dan Buster Studio, which, um, for those who don't know, was the ex Crytek UK studio. Um Whilst I was there, I basically worked on Homefront Revolution mostly. Um, mm. I also dabbled in a few um, other projects that were either, you know, kind of like prototypes or just unreleased stuff. Um, and then basically that brought me to um, Cloud Imperium, where I am now. As you said, I'm uh, currently lead level designer on Squadron 42, and I've been here for four and a half years now. So it's it's been a fun ride so far. Yeah, man, and congratulations on your career thus far, mate. It seems very fruitful, and it seems like you've had some great projects to work on. So, great job on that one, mate. Yeah, and we've thanks. got a, a range of topics we want to talk about here, mate, because you, you came up with a fantastic list of things for us to to talk about. And I think the first one, we spoke a little bit off, <laughs> off air on this, so we had to stop ourselves. I think the first and first, like, most important part is basically breaking into the industry. And one of the key things for people to have when breaking into the industry is that of a portfolio. So I'm wondering if we want to touch on that and kind of tips and tricks on how to people to progress to get to, you know, a career in games. Yeah, no, I think it sounds like a really good um, opportunity. And to be honest, especially as a lead, it's something I get asked about quite a lot because mm. obviously, you know, we get a lot of uh, kind of job applications and people kind of coming and looking how to get into games or even people who have kind of worked on smaller games and you know, kind of want to get into bigger games essentially. So yeah, um, I guess the, the thing that probably makes the most sense is to start about how I got into games, I guess, um, and kind of explain, I guess, how that happened for me. And, sure. you know, maybe Max, you can even say, you know, how you got into it as well. Like I know you briefly mentioned about um, university as well. Um, yeah. So basically it's actually really funny because 
growing up, I was completely obsessed with games. Like, I, basically, I think I got bought a a NES when I was two, and I, basically, I, I've never known anything other than games. It's yeah. like it's always been my life. And what's really strange is I never thought about being able to make them for a, a living. <laughs> like, I just assumed, oh, games are great. You know, they're, they're a thing. I, I never even considered that people make games and people. Mm can make games as a as a profession so um it wasn't actually until i pretty much finished high school that i just had flat out no idea about it um and then what actually happened was i was like okay i finished high school I guess i better go to college <laughs> no idea what i want to do <laughs> yeah um at the time i was actually um like my dad is a, a joiner or a carpenter, so um, I'd kind of spent like the last three or four years kind of working with him and doing jobs at like how, people's houses and stuff. So it was almost the certainty that I was actually going to go into doing that as well. Um, but anyway, I, so I went to college, and then when I was looking at like what courses I can do, and I was like, well, I'll just pick the ones that sound most interesting to me. And then it wasn't until I was looking towards the back end of college, and I was like, oh universities have courses on games i was like that that's weird <laughs> the sign like, there mate <laughs> and then at that point i was like well you know this, this what, what else am i supposed to do like this is it i've obviously got mm. to go and make games um so in some respects you could say i was quite especially now um i was quite late kind of realizing that game design was an option you know because growing up we have all the the kind of usual um job aspirations of being like a pirate and everything else and then you know it's not <laughs> yeah the places. simple stuff of pirates <laughs> and astronauts yeah so um so yeah so when i finally figured out and it's like a light bulb moment where i was like you know games are what i want to make yeah and then suddenly it was just like my everything shifted because you know i i, I wasn't particularly fussed about kind of school was somewhere i had to be because i had to be there and same mm. with college it was just like because it felt like the right thing to do because of my future um but the second I knew like, there was games, that was it. Like it, there wasn't a, a doubt, and I just suddenly like my whole kind of life just changed. Um, and at that point, obviously, I started learning about as whatever I could outside of before I got to uni, and then uh, mm -hmm. essentially went obviously to uni. And I actually went to um, Salford University, which is in Manchester, um, and. I, this is going to make me sound really old now. But, <laughs> um, I think the big difference was like there wasn't actually much to learn how to make games yourself, you know, unless you kind of knew where to look. It was a lot more like, here's a book, and then you would you know, go and buy a book that had like a, de a disc with it. Um, and it would be like full of stuff that's like completely oh, out of date yeah. because they've updated <laughs> yeah. the software. <laughs> so. Um, when I went to uni, I, I was still pretty much clueless. Like, you know, I didn't know how to make games. I'd, I think I'd done things like RPG Maker and um, stuff that I just basically downloaded and like, had to play around on. But um, it was really kind of eye-opening to me. And it was kind of funny because it felt in a lot of ways like the uni course was also very new. And, like, obviously my, my lecturers were, were great and, have, you know, had some experience beforehand. But... It was all very much tribal knowledge of how to make games and that there wasn't really much kind of like oh here's how you make this or here's how you do this and there mm. wasn't even much access to software like um this is gonna make me sound really old but um <laughs> yeah we just used to draw pictures on caves <laughs> <laughs> so i th i th i'd like to think it was towards the the christmas of my first year at uni but it could have been the second so which is awful but um unreal 3 came out basically at least you know the public version of it where you buy unreal tournament free and you'd get basically the unreal Ed unreal free editor as part yep. of the package um and that was great but the thing was was we got it and there was like very limited info anywhere about how to do anything um obviously it was brand new tech so the the lecturers didn't know how to use it and they're like, oh, yeah, you can use it for your projects if you want. And it's like, okay, well, we've, we've got to figure it out ourselves pretty much. Um, and it was a huge kind of learning curve, and it was very, very difficult. Um, and then, obviously, 
kind of fast forwarding on through the rest of the, the uni, like, you know, I got quite familiar with Unreal 3 and everything uh, actually turned out to be really great using it. But it was such a weird time because essentially like no one really knew how to use anything. And, you know, you look at like now, for example, with Unreal 4 and I guess Unreal 5 and Unity as well. And yeah, yeah. There's, there's so much like, I mean, I'm super jealous, but <laughs> there's there's so much for people to kind of look at and learn how to do things now. And it's, it's, it's wonderful basically, but, um, what I wouldn't have give you know, to have that at that time. Oh, for um, sure, mate. And like the, the resources that have come with, like you said, you had to get these books, which you could kill a person with. They were as thick as a brick <laughs> and try and like, try read that. Cause there's, I'm not gonna lie as much as I, I love the resources and the books, it's a very dry topic <laughs> to like read 2000, 3000 pages on. Right. So like yeah. it's, it's incredible. Yeah. What, what the industry is right now, especially, you know, when you, you when you're actually like trying to figure out to do one very specific thing, like how do I trigger mm. this to work? And it's like, it's 400 pages in. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's, there's no hint as to where it is. You just have to go through all the way through the book to get to that point. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it was very different. And like you said, when you put on the, the discs that came with it, like I completely forgot the, the word discs that came with it. You're right. And then just, you know, either it's talking about something that, or that doesn't make sense or the, the view that you have versus the view they have doesn't match up. So things aren't harder to find. So it's harder to follow along. So yeah, man, I, geez, I remember. I'd love a design lobby. We believe everybody has a story to tell. Hobbyist or student, freelancer or veteran, we made it our mission to unite those who share our passion for creating and developing great games. Thanks to our generous Patreon backers, we've been able to do just that. So if you've already pledged your support, thank you. If not, you too can ensure the future of Level Design Lobby, helping us to create even more exciting content, collaborations, interviews, and much more. With awesome perks and rewards, whether you're a seasoned professional or just getting started, you're sure to find something for you. Want to share tips, tricks and advice with passionate, like-minded developers? Our awesome community Discord has you covered. Fancy practicing your level design, creating strong portfolio content and having fun? Then try our level design weekends. Or perhaps you want to individually discuss your work, hone your skills or level up your career then consider our one-on-one -on -one mentorships. If you share our vision, then go to patreon.com forward slash level design lobby for more information and to pledge your support. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, the thing that was actually quite cool about my um, my course at uni was it was just a, it was called computer and video games. Um, so it actually covered all like subtopics, I guess. So we did a little bit of programming, did a bit of art, did a bit of design, did a bit of sound and narrative as well. Um, and it was really cool because obviously it was kind of nice that you get to do these and it's kind of like everyone kind of like cowers when they realize that it's the programming course next. And, you know, it's like it was, it was actually really good to just kind of get a little bit of a background, you know, in each of those kind of areas, even though, you know, you, you're probably never going to go much deeper into them. And I think... As a designer, um, I personally find it you know, super useful to understand a little bit more of what other departments are doing, because if, if you're asking somebody for something, then, you know, if, if you at least have a remote understanding of what you're asking for, it's easier to ask, right? Um, so I completely agree, mate, completely agree. Like if you want to be able to communicate efficiently and understand more of like, is it actually possible? It doesn't hurt to know about the, your, your, your teammates, like processes at all. Yep. Um, and obviously like, again, I, I don't want to just kind of make this all about me. Like, I don't know if your uni was similar, Max, or, if, you know, the experience was slightly different or. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, our unis are similar to a degree. Um, like I, I learned a bit at school, but <laughs> like just, because yeah. we had a, a new, like the other IT teachers were great. I just want to say that, like, I'm very fortunate to have great teachers throughout my throughout my, you know, studies in, in my life. And there was a, one of the new IT teachers had come and he taught Flash 
to like year seven and year eight, Flash, how to make Flash games. And I knew I wanted to get into games. I was at the time I was using Little Big Planet uh, level editor to make stuff. Nothing any good, just for the record, but using it to make. And then like Unity had first like come out, and like instead of Unreal Tournament, uh, an editor came with Gears of War, so I'd use that. Um, but like uh, learning, I learned a bit of uh, action scripts and how to, to script in that to make. You know, the first game I made, I think I was like fifteen. It wasn't anything good, just for the record. But like you had a ship. And you just had two buttons where you'd move it left or right, and then asteroids would come down. And you'd just see how long you'd go before it blew up, right? Yeah. Um, but like the same thing in terms of uni happens, right? So like we we had, uh, I guess, Unreal Three as well. You're in this new transition of mobile games were exploding at this time, or like just becoming mainstay. Yeah. Like I remember when Candy Crush first launched and i remember looking at that time you know once you've spent all your turns you have to wait another 24 hours thinking god that's so stupid (laughs) egg on my face like that was one of the things that like transcended into you know this this type of game well that's why it's worth money right well yeah (laughs) yeah i guess when you, you look at it from an innocent kind of especially you know pre kind of industry you kind of go oh well, you know that's a silly design decision who would ever want to do that <laughs> you obviously realize that yeah that. and also like he's designing for mobile is obviously different to design for for triple a right like because it's not the same in terms of well okay like if <laughs> if you paid 60 bucks and then they asked you to do that like god no you wouldn't want to to do it but yeah it's it's different in how it changes everything yeah. so yeah and for me I, I got into uni i went to teesside university and that's where i was like again i i didn't have much more that i had a similar thing like with your experience of like i knew a little bit more but i still didn't understand everything you know there was people in my course that knew way more than i did in our first year we got to try art animation and uh design as well and so you'd at the end of the first year you'd pick whichever path you want to follow to get your degree in and it was uh yeah it was a very good uh time to to learn there and i was lucky enough to get you know i was constantly working on on stuff where i was able to get a internship at a a mobile studio called uh, free online games fog media for short and it was a great time and from there i was able to luckily build a portfolio with released games on it as well and they had competitions like i was part of um dare to be digital i think that was in 2013 2012 2013 and yeah it was Big great for that. that yeah so like great experience to to do that and from there i was able to go uh, into to ubisoft by having you know, a, a portfolio worth showing, but yeah, similar experience in there. Like of, you know, new tech again was coming out, still learning different ways to make it. You know, we didn't have as much like U- Unity was just just starting to make a name for itself when it first came out. You know, uh, not many people were using it at the time, right? So again, switching, switching over. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, that, that yeah. actually uh, brings me up to quite an interesting topic, which I haven't really considered much. But mm. um, in terms of university, like you obviously mentioned about Teesside and then going to Ubisoft, which um, I'm assuming the one at Reflections, right? In, uh, yes, Newcastle. correct, in Newcastle. Yeah. Um, and obviously, like I said, I, I was at uni in, in Salford in Manchester, and then I basically I managed to get my job straight out of uni. I was actually kind of put forward by one of my lecturers Oh wow. um, for... Well, it's funny, actually, because the actual job was um, for QA, um, for the actual, I think, the first internal QA team at at TT. Okay. Um, And I actually ended up only doing QA for about six weeks before I moved into design. Oh, that's amazing. Um, But the thing I was trying to get at, basically, is it's interesting because the thing I want to kind of touch on a little bit is, you know, the, the... is uni a good idea essentially and something that's kind of interesting from this talk is that you know companies tend to hire students close by or at least you know remotely close yeah by. Mm-hmm. so um i mean we can touch more on that but i think something that's super kind of important i think is about universities is if people are going is to actually 
research the, yep. the university and not just obviously if, because like not all universities are equal um no you know some are definitely better than others um but also you know this is obviously i mean it's not you know the pure reason for it by any stretch of the means but it certainly you know makes sense that if there's a university close to a game dev studio and you know they're turning out decent talent that that company would more likely look at that studio and potentially even have kind of programs or you know kind of naturally at least um some kind of communication where they say oh look you know have you got any good students kind of lined up and it it certainly makes sense so if if people are after like jobs at certain places, it may not be a good idea to get to a university that's nearby. Mm, I completely agree. And like you said, a lot of the times they end up having some sort of ties or, you know, they're just, luckily someone from the, the university, sorry, the studio will visit the university to either review work or something, which is always great too. So yeah, that's no, a great point. I think, especially nowadays with, Uni uh, universities having more game dev courses and it's not just universities obviously a lot of game dev courses out there just in general yeah. it, you are right mate like there needs to be some research into it and trying to make sure that is the the right one for you personally but also one that will hopefully be beneficial towards your career yeah absolutely and i think you look at i mean some are obviously more expensive than others i think but university especially if you do go to university as opposed to a college because i know colleges also do a lot of game, games courses now um is that you know you're gonna be in, in debt essentially or you're mm -hmm. gonna be paying out a lot of money for it so you, like as much as obviously you're there to learn and kind of you know better yourself you know you want to be getting the right thing out of them as well so i think you know rather than just going oh well this this place is nearby so i'm just going to go to it it's you know, sometimes I would definitely consider your options a little bit more. Um, and just on a personal level as well, like for me, when I did go to uni, like having the whole like uni lifestyle and experience that's, you know, beyond the actual course is as much of a reason why I don't regret going to university as anything else, even, you know, um, as well as going going to transition into, which is the yeah. the fact that is uni, you know, the right decision essentially. Mm. Yeah, man. Um, and I think looking like you know, especially we were just touching on obviously how much Unreal and Unity and you know various other things. I mean, there's obviously there's even a lot of kind of um, other options these days as well, which I, I don't want to just kind of keep touching on Unreal and Unity, but they're, they're obviously the big ones. Um, but there's just so much choice for people now. Um, and this is where it obviously comes down to like, is uni right for you? And I think maybe we want to kind of touch a little bit on what we were saying at the start that is portfolios, um, which I, I think ultimately is the kind of the big kind of bubble that we're trying to encompass all of this into. And that the, the most important part of getting a job in the first place is a portfolio. Um, Agreed, think, mate ultimately how you get that portfolio doesn't really matter um i think this is where it kind of then comes down into like what is the right thing to do so i think it ultimately it's down to the person um like what suits your needs the most so mm. university is great and it can be a great gateway into the games industry um, yep. as we said if you know you go to the right ones you learn the right things you meet the right people um but it can also leave you with a lot of debt and you could be no better off for it. And you could end up having to do what some people do without going to university anyway. Um, so I think really you need to find out if, you know, which option is right for you rather than just kind of saying, oh, well, I need to go to university. Um, I think even if you look at games, like on websites and they kind of say, um, uh, sorry, at, at game jobs. And they basically say, oh, you know, you must have a degree in this in order to get a job. And yeah. if you, I can tell you now, if you went to one of those studios and you blew them away with a portfolio, they wouldn't care if you went to university or not. Like, Agreed. I think the university thing really is, uh, like you should think about it only if you want to work abroad. Like that yes. is the only time where I've seen that play a factor. And again, that doesn't necessarily affect every country there, but like 
it does affect others. So I, I completely agree with you. Like a, a strong portfolio is worth more than a first or a, a two one degree, right? I think yeah. that's the most important thing is that you have a strong example of work that you can give to give to someone. And I think, as I was saying, the you know whether you learn from all the abundance of resources that there are online now, or you know you, you have like these obviously the online courses like which I know you know you're kind of like starting to take part in kind of mentorship stuff mm. actually this summer and um, that sort of stuff is you know can be equally beneficial if not more so to a lot of people because you can do it your own way essentially yep. like. Um, the thing with university is like, don't get me wrong, it's it's wonderful having that time. And what I wouldn't do to have another three years of not working and being able to make my own projects. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, right. <laughs> especially, you know, with the, the current tech, like, you know, I would love that. Oh, um, yeah. But, yeah, the, there's just so much to um, to consider now that one, one thing that's right for one person may not be right for the other. Um, and just before we kind of divert too far away from it, like you're right about what you said about abroad. Like I know this is actually a question that gets asked a lot is mm. I have people like on Twitter or whoever or else. And they're basically, you know, like, Oh, I'm interested in a job and they might have a wonderful portfolio, but they live somewhere where they need a visa to come over. Yep. And if they've got no previous experience from a government perspective, it is near impossible to get them over. Um, yep. And as you were saying, a university degree actually gives you points, especially at some universities where that allows you to get into a country on a visa. Mm. Um, I think once you start to get to like the higher levels, as you're saying, like to a senior or a lead or, or whatever else, is it becomes easier because yes. you're essentially, like without going into the specifics of it too much, ultimately what the company has to do is prove to the government that they can't find someone like you in their country. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you're, you know, graduating out of university or even, you know, just, you've just made a, a really cool mod or even a portfolio. Um, it's very hard to say, well, well, nobody else has, you know, been able to do something similar. So it, it is very difficult and it can hugely, you know, help your chances if that's the case. <laughs> Yeah, and I think also, but it, <coughs> oh, sorry. Um, you brought up that great point there of, especially when you don't have any experience, even if you do have a degree, we just want to make this clear, like even if you have a degree and have zero experience, you, the chances of a company moving you somewhere are slim. It's not that it doesn't happen, but it is slim. So again, yeah, experience will always play as a, as a key factor. Uh, for that but yeah it is something like we said we're, we're, we're mentioning to keep in mind because that might be something you want to do later so have that there for you but yeah, yeah like in, t in terms of just getting a job though like if we were just you know say your country has a great industry for it then I, sometimes i i mean i sometimes wouldn't necessarily even like i don't I don't begrudge my university experience because I had a great time and it ended up working out very well for me. But as you said, like it's a lot of money that you are in, in debt for. Yeah. And especially now, like we said, there's so many resources online that are like just even remotely free, let alone some of these other courses that you can get, which can cost like a third of the price, if not less, you know, yeah. is incredible resources out there for people. And that's it. And like to kind of emphasize, like I, I wouldn't change how I, you know, my past or how I got here. Um, like I'm, I'm totally happy with how it went. Um, funnily enough, which is also another really interesting fact, like for anyone who's, you know, not aware already that the games industry is so small that, and what I mean by that is about 80% of the people I went to university with, I've worked with them since. In, in one capacity or another, one of the three studios, and not because we've come to the studio at the same time, or you know, because we've you know pulled each other in. It's just by pure coincidence. We've I've I've gone to one location, like when I went to um, to Dan Buster and mm. um, Matt Phillips, who was the one of the programmers there. He was again, he was in my course at, at university, and then basically, like, he was just there, and I was like, oh, <laughs> <right."> <laughs> it's like. 
and that happens so much. Yeah. Um, but aside, I mean, aside from everything else, is obviously in games. I, I guess once you start to kind of get more involved and kind of speak to more people, it's like it. it that is essentially like word gets around and people know each mm. other. And nine times out of ten, if you apply for a job, they look at your history and then they, rather than anything else, like they won't pay attention. Well, I, I don't want to say they won't pay attention, but um, it'll be less about someone going, did they get a first or a second in this degree? It'll be more about the look for someone who went to that uni with them and be like, what's this person like? Yeah. That is almost, I mean, it's it's kind of backwards in a lot of ways but you know they they get more of an opinion from someone they know than necessarily what a piece of paper will tell you for sure and i think it's that's another thing was like you the, the one of the pros of uni is like like you said that is already you networking with a team of people that could potentially be in your industry may help you get somewhere or like i said you may meet again later later down the road so that's definitely something that like is another pro when it goes to to going to university. Yeah, for that. Um, so I don't know if uh, Max, if you if you think like we should start, actually start talking about portfolios. <laughs> sure, <laughs> we, yeah. we, we've kind of said like all this random stuff. I've obviously waffled a little bit about kind of what I've done um, and how I got into games, mm. but we've not really touched on what we're saying is the most important part, which yes. is obviously the portfolio. Um, For sure, man. For sure. And I, I know we were briefly talking before we actually had the, um, we, we started the show, but, and we were laughing saying that like when we were, you know, at university, like I was, well, we, we were often told that, you know, like a portfolio wasn't that important. Like you were just, you know, or if it was, it would be something that you, like a piece of paper that you have like a map yep. design on that you you would take in in a little kind of sleeve and be like, oh, look at this nice little drawing I did. Um, and that is not how it works, unfortunately. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> so like a lot of people, and again, um, a lot of people think of, and I'll say this, obviously we're kind of talking about this predominantly as level design, but just as, design and games in general i suppose is that it's well design especially it's not just about showing visuals it's almost anything but visuals and mm. people often fall into the trap of oh well like level design in particular is visual heavy i mean sure it is and you need visuals to sell what you're selling yep but it's not people don't look at the visuals like you know, they want to know why something's the way it is or how something's yes. done and, um that's the kind of key and in some cases this is actually where i feel like um people who like students and people who haven't had a job in games yet can actually do better portfolios than people who've mm. been in the games industry for years and this is probably totally an excuse for me saying like how bad my portfolio <laughs> is in comparison to, to everybody else's but um it's like once you get into games as um you could, you know, very wrapped up in like NDAs, especially for, you know, kind of bit, bigger projects and stuff. And um, there's a lot of stuff even after a game ships that you can't actually show. Um, like I have so many kind of like documents and like designs and work yep. in progress things that are, would be awesome to show in a portfolio. But because of like the legalities of it all, like, you know, I can't put half of it on my website or anything like that because. Yeah. I'll just get sued. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like we well, said, student debt was bad enough, but now getting sued is not the the best way to add to your finances for sure. Yeah, but um, I think that's one of the, the, the flip sides, and it is almost backwards in some ways. That by saying you've worked on a project, you it's like you know that is more valuable to someone than actually seeing what they've done. Um, because you could have worked yeah. on a project and you might not have done anything <laughs> like you know you could have been on it like two weeks or um on the flip side you could have done everything and you're not kind of getting the recognition you deserve basically but yeah that's the i think that's the t so like I said, it's the double-edged sword of it right where like you you don't know necessarily what someone has done but the fact that, like sometimes just the project's name itself will carry you a bit yeah but it is a thing of like is we both know 
uh, and this is slightly off topic. We'll get back to portfolios and uh, what we were mentioning. But it's 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 one of the big things to especially show, and it, is, it does apply to students because I, I see a lot of students do group projects. Yeah. Like really lay out what you've done for this. And even though you've worked on a st- student project, you will know also that everyone gets their hands on something by the end of it, right? It gets it, ownership will be passed or you know, you, especially with level design, so many overlapping elements come together to make this. Yeah. So it, it's about trying to make sure, like we said, you show your your work and your design decisions behind it. Like I said, it's not just about having a uh, some pictures of the level. You know, explain why you took that picture. Is it the way that you're trying to show off the guidance or where the enemies have come in? really take time to break it down and really tell us why or the reader why you have made these design decisions because as you mentioned mate, it's not always the best level that gets the job it's us wanting to understand how and why you design in a certain form or fashion yeah and i think there's something else that's kind of point out that again we can dig a little bit deeper into the portfolios but don't be afraid to use like let's take Unity or Unreal for example. Like, don't be afraid to use, um, you know, like marketplace assets or assets from things that you can mm-hmm. use. Um, like if if you just have a simple acknowledgement on your portfolio that says like I I use these from here here yep. and here and give references. Like, no one's going to penalize you for using those assets. Like, if anything, if it a designer's job ultimately is to show intent. Yes. And to show what the point is, we know whether that's to the person that you're pitching the game to, whether it's for you know for the interviewer, if it's for even like you know within the game, like on on the project, like if you're pitching the feature or the level to other developers in other departments, your goal is to show intent. So exactly, whatever you need to get that across is you know not a bad thing. Exactly. And I, I was actually listening to someone, a uh, student today say, oh, well, I don't want to use the same kit as everyone else. That, that shouldn't be an issue. What we want to see is, well, you know, how did you use it? It's not about what you use, it's how you use it at the end of the day. What are you able to build with these pieces? So yeah, give the acknowledgement, let us know, but let's just see how creative you can get with this. Oh man. And I think also just like going from it is like, I, you know, unless you can get and don't, and you'll know more about this mate than I do. When you apply, there's normally hundreds of other people applying for that position. Right. So you need to make sure that your work is easy to get to. I always say your work should be the front page, not the about you section. I always think it's just Get to it as fast. Amazing how many people you know have the about me section as their homepage. Oh yeah, Mm -hmm. like I I get it. Like you know, you're you're taught to, especially if you do go to university or even schools and stuff, you're taught to sell yourself. Yep. And it's like you know, it's nice, but people like I I don't want to be harsh about it, but people obviously you know that that is a secondary thought. Like they want to see what you're doing. Like. I mean, it it should be good, right? That people are judged on their their achievements, not what they look like or you know what they sound like. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's the thing, really. Is it you just need to sell yourself as you know your your work and show what it is as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, like as you're saying, I, I as a lead, like you know, we have a lot of kind of job applicants come in. Mm. And, um, the thing is, is like I, I personally like to think that I give everybody like portfolio like a decent look over and try to you know kind of find the things that are hidden beneath. Um, but I also know that how difficult. Like if I, if I, as an example, like when we're not currently looking for a, a level designer, um, but like you know in a week I might still get like ten applicants for a job. Mm. Um, and, you know, like, even if we're not looking, you know, we still like to kind of look and, you know, give people the, the attention they deserve. But when we've got a lot of other things and our actual jobs to do as well, um, like a lot of people won't give those portfolios the time they deserve. And sometimes it's 
you only get like a tiny shot to make them keep looking. Yeah. And it's it's essentially that hook that you need that kind of mm. keeps them going. Um, I think that's also like another great bit when you say the hook, right? Especially if you're you're like you don't have a, a, a release title. I was saying like obviously make sure the work is there. So because you can get hooked by seeing the work, not again necessarily who that person is, not in a bad way. The second thing is is like designing a portfolio versus designing a level is a different experience. So do look into things such as color theory. Do think about the amount of like websites I see that are still just, and I, I've been there and I've been guilty for it as well. Just black text on a white background. Don't do that. They said, pull someone in. Like it needs to be an entertaining page as well to get someone hooked. I've seen some great work where uh, they have like a, some sort of animated GIF as their, their background. It's like, uh, it might be like a snowy mountain in the level they worked on, but you just have the snow falling in the background and it's really nice because he's like oh okay like now i'm intrigued things like this so like you know I, I, again i'm not saying this because my portfolio is amazing it's not but one of the things that I, I i recently added to mine was so i have my like uh my level of my projects on it and when you hover over them the trailer will start to to play for the game you can click on it and go into the page but again just something where you're like oh okay let's get someone to look for a little bit longer, think about these things. They do take time. But as you mentioned, mate, having a hook, having something that makes this stand out differently to to other people's presentation is also important, sadly. Yeah, and I think so you, you've actually touched on something which I'm, I'm quite passionate about in portfolios recently is, um, like I actually sent you the link to one of my current level designers who's um, basically joined us as an intern from... Uh, the game assembly about it was in September last year and is now one mm. of our regular level designers. Um, again, we can kind of post his his link for his portfolio. Yeah, it'll be down but in the description below for those who want to check it out. It's um, it's super kind of um, impressive. Like, I mean, obviously, like I said, I, I see a lot of portfolios, and you know, this the kind of caliber of, of this one in particular is uh, well, to be honest, like most of the, the portfolios that come out of the TGA. Um, but it's the bar is just so high that it's like it's higher than a lot of portfolios I would see for people you know like five plus years of experience. Mm. Um, and the, I wanted to kind of show and call out this portfolio as an example because I think there's a lot of pe things in there that people could look at and take ideas from and kind yep. of come up with their own. Um, I want to kind of emphasize like i i know full well from like especially you know with imposter syndrome and everything that people will see this portfolio and be like oh my god i can never make that so i'm just going to give up now mm. that's not what i'm suggesting at all like if someone that hasn't had a job before um or e even someone especially someone who has had a job before should we say um like if if they had a third of what's on this portfolio like that would be you know enough to warrant a conversation i think yeah so but just kind of going back to what you were saying is like i'm super keen and what it shows quite a lot on on this portfolio is having almost like glorified gifs mm -hmm. throughout the page that just kind of show snippets of either like design theory or how something's been iterated or how it works and yeah because as we said well, it's a very weird situation because we're like saying we don't want to see the level, we don't want to see your work, we want to know what you did, but we don't want to read your work <laughs> because we don't want to read because there's too many yeah. words. <laughs> so you have to find that nice balance between like, oh, here's something really cool, and then have a little bit of information with it, and then have yes. something else that's cool, and then a little bit more, and you're you're essentially breadcrumbing um, snippets of information. And before you know it, they've actually gone all the way down the page and read much more than they ever planned to. Um, which essentially is at that point, they're like, you know, I need to speak to this person. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it, mate. It's like, it's like a presentation at the end of the day. No one <laughs> signs up to a presentation to see or to watch. Uh, sorry, to read the presentation. They're there to watch you give that information. So again, similar things. Think about how you can do it, whether that be through gifs videos or just pictures perfectly fine but you're just trying to show show that information in an entertaining way because yeah sometimes like some people will 
download the link if you do have a link to to play. But as we talked about earlier, not everyone will have time, even if they wanted to, to play this. So giving it in a digestible manner. And I think the thing that I really like about the the portfolio you linked, mate, and I think it's always important, is them breaking down their design in different elements, whether that be stealth design, whether that be the combat here. There's some really great moments where they're breaking it down into digestible chunks for it. Not everyone will read everything here or even go through all the sections, which again, is fine. You do not necessarily, you need to understand that that's just how it will go. But as long as you have that information there, that's important in itself. One of the things that I recommend people to do is also do like a walkthrough through your level. Like again, not everyone's going to watch the entire video, but they might just section off chunks through. Like, okay, well, this here is the part where they talk about their metrics. This here is the point where they talk about their different iterations. And I always say it's nice to have a GIF of your iterations of the level going through as well from your first block out to how it finally launched. So it makes you taking screenshots as you are making your level as well. Yeah, they're really nice to see. And again, there's something, I mean, so, sometimes you can kind of cheat depending on, you know, if you have any kind of backups and stuff. But having the foresight to do that as well also shows planning. Mm. And it's kind of like, you know, you've sh- you've shown that you're, you intend to kind of show progress. And I think it, it's it's almost like you learn more from a portfolio about what people aren't saying than what they are saying. Yeah. I think that's also an important one as well is like the script, like there's so much that goes into level design just in general, right? Like we talked about, it's a kind of a, a, the, the, the boiling point where everyone's work comes together to be shown. And even as LDs, right, we have to plan out the level, block it out, and then we have to script elements too. So do spend time scripting that as well, whether that just be, as we talked about, you purchase an AI, an AI pack, from you know the Unity or Unreal marketplace and store, and then just use it to have com- like show the combat, show the patrols. That there is super important as well. Like, do not neglect that side either. Yeah, you've actually reminded me of something which I, I meant to actually write down and I hadn't done. Um, <laughs> but um, essentially, another big thing that kind of screws people over a little bit in um, portfolios is not knowing what you are. Um, right this is a very very easy thing to do i think especially for people who you know don't have the experience i mean even people who have the experience it's, it's very easy to get mixed up but um like ultimately your portfolio should be a strong statement as to what you are and what you you love like I've seen a lot of people apply for jobs and I, I totally get it and I understand the reasons why, but they might say, I'm a level designer and an environment artist or yeah. and, and the UI designer and concept artist. There's, you know, two or three different jobs. And don't get me wrong, it's, it's great to have like a, a, a secondary kind of like preference and thing that you also do that can make you as a better designer. Um, but whilst a lot of people probably think i mean for me like and i apologize if i'm wrong but the vast majority i think it's a combination of i'm i'm edging my bets a little bit as to you know i will take either of these jobs because i just love what i do so much i just want a Mm. job which is you know totally understandable um the other aspect is you may think that oh well i'm i'm multi-skilled like i want to kind of shout it from the rooftops that i can do both of these things and that's a, a huge plus and it, it, it is a plus, certainly, that you you know you have interest in more than one thing. But for example, when I'm hiring a level designer, I want to hire a level designer that knows they're a level designer and you mm. know is likely to still be a level designer in twelve months' time. Like, um, because anyone who's hiring for a job, unless obviously you know there are exceptions, especially like contracts and stuff. But for any kind of permanent job, for me, I when I try to hire people, I look for people who I want to be in the team long term, like who, you know, will be part of the group or be here for years to come, hopefully, obviously, you know, who knows what's going to happen down the line, but at least have that intention. And I can see building into a strong part of the team long term. And if your portfolio says, I I think I want to be this, but I'm not 100% certain, I would also be happy doing this. 
to me, that could also say in 12 months' time, I might change my mind and want to go do something else. Um, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, if you want to change what you want to do, that's that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, but from a hiring perspective, like, you know, you ultimately one of the calls is to, like, what is going to make the most sense to the, the team long term. It's not just for, like, an immediate kind of fix, essentially. Um, so you can also very easily, you know, put yourself on the back foot just by simply saying that you do these two things. Um, yeah. And I think when it comes to the portfolios as well, um, like this is something that maybe you're aware of as well, Max. And actually mm. Ubisoft is a good example for me, but um I know that a lot of companies, like if you say what is level design or what is world building, Mm. One stu- to one studio that means one thing and to yep. another studio that could be something completely different um, and the, what they call their their roles or what those roles do are different from project to project and company to company mm. so you could be signing yourself up to a job that you think does X, Y and Z when it's actually something, something completely different um, which is an off topic but Obviously, if anyone does have an interview and they um, are obviously looking to get a job and it's looking promising, make sure you, you ask exactly what they expect of you in the job yep. as well. Like that's that's not a bad question to ask because it just shows that you care and you want to make sure you're you're applying for the right job, basically. Um, but this is also kind of true to the rest of the portfolio. Is that if you say, "I want to be," A level designer and then we were briefly talking about this before um, about art station actually yeah and, like if if you want to go away and make your portfolio as an art station site like there's there's nothing inherently wrong with that like art station is obviously very cool for showing off very visual heavy things um but i think it's a very easy mistake to think that level design is about visuals like it's yep. not um, and I think we, we kind of said this earlier, but um, ultimately, if if you have your site and it looks like you're saying you're one thing, but then when I look through the work or, you know, whoever looks through your work, it paints a very different picture of what role you, you actually do. That is also yeah. going to work against you um, because you're kind of, you've got to remember that in 95% of the cases, if not more, someone who's looking at your website or your portfolio for a job is looking at it for a very specific role and is only involved in that role. Mm. Like, sure, if something stands out, it's like, say I get someone apply for a level design job, um, or one that's actually, you'd be surprised how common it is, is when someone applies for a design job and they're actually applying for a graphic design job, not, yeah. <laughs> not a game design job. And it's like, you know, they're a really good graphic designer, but they've never touched level design before or anything like that. And again, to me, it's like kind of like, oh, well, you know, maybe if it's exceptional, I will pass it on to, um, you know, the graphic design team or the UI team to basically say, oh, look, you know, there's this really good candidate that's come across my desk, but they're not quite suited for us. Um, at the same time, and this is something else I can't, express enough is that when you're applying for a job as well just read the instructions mm -hmm. <laughs> like and this is moving off topic a little bit but even, again like even when we um like obviously in some cases we will send out design tests and to me that sometimes the best or often the best design tests that come back are not the ones that are like the most visually impressive they're the ones that have listened to the instructions in the oh, test. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if you if someone goes away and makes something that looks absolutely amazing, but it's not what we asked for, to me that doesn't say you're an amazing level designer. That tells me you can't follow instructions. Yep. So I I'm much more interested in someone who, you know, listens and wants to, you know, learn and get better and be part of the team than someone who, who just wants to show off, essentially. And mm. I, I obviously don't want to make that you know into a negative thing, but um, I think for me, it, it you know, 
there's also an element of that that you just really need to think about what you're applying for, how you're applying for it, and you know just how you go about it in general because little things like that can go a lot further than you think. Mm, agreed. And I think that you made a great point on also the art station is like, don't get me wrong, there are designers who look at art station, but I don't know many who, who do browse art station, like other than the odd occasion, right? That doesn't mean that that evidence is a hundred percent true. Or it doesn't mean that there isn't people out there doing that. Let's just make that clear. But as you mentioned, most job roles you'll see advertised on ArtStation are for artist positions. So make sure, again, that you know that, like, the jobs you may want to see. And maybe I'm wrong. And like I said, I don't peruse ArtStation in great detail. I check it once in a while. But just, again, yeah, make sure it's in a place where people can or you can see the jobs that you're looking for. And again, like it's hard to find all that stuff unless you're like scouring your the companies all the time, right? Like you never know what's out there or someone on LinkedIn is dropping you a message. But uh, yeah, just really make sure that, and again, when we talk about the visual elements, prioritize or understand, especially for level design, like the best thing or the best way to show a level is someone play it. If it's not that, it's a video. If it's not that, it's a GIF. If it's not that, it's a picture. And if it's not that, it's words. And that's the hierarchy in terms of like engagement and best showing off your level, like really there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that actually reminds me of a really good example where um, at the same time, like if you want to do something, like don't make it overcomplicated just because you can or you think you should. Like simpler is better if it gets the point across. Um the reason why I say that is I I have a really good example where I was looking for a, a level designer last year and I was actually came across one person's portfolio and it looked really promising. I started it and um, what they actually had was a, a web browser game, essentially. So it was like, oh, great. I can actually play that level on the web browser. I don't have to download anything. Mm. I can go straight in and I was like, that's wonderful. And then what happened was um, I started the game up I was in the first room and it was basically like a jail cell and like obviously the jail was locked so I was looking around the room and I basically found a hole that I was supposed to climb through it was basically like it was blocked with some rubble um and Max you may be able to tell I'm going with this but um, (laughs) it was physicalized rubble right so um basically I turned around and the idea was you were supposed to press a button to make the rubble fall over um so I did that and the rubble fell and because the rubble was physicalized, it got stuck and yep. I couldn't get through the hole. <laughs> so essentially my experience of that portfolio was that room. Yeah. Um, and it, in full fairness, I actually did try to play it a second time and it, I got stuck again. Um, but mo- a lot of people that are looking at websites wouldn't even go, you know, to that second chance. Yeah. Like, it could the next the thing on the other side of that wall could have been the most amazing level design I've ever seen, but I will never get to see it because it, I was just <laughs> stuck from a bug. And so, that's yeah, it's such a that, that's the other important thing is like you only get to make one impression on your portfolio, whether that be like you mentioned playing it and make sure to play test the hell out of it if you if you want to do that, yeah. or like you said, making sure everything is the correct spelling or there's so much that goes into it. And like we do, we are, we might sound a bit like sticklers on this, but honestly it's better to be a stickler on yourself now than it is to someone to reject you for something that you might not have realized. Ah, if I just spent more time on that. Yeah. And it's, it's a horrible situation because I mean, for all they know, that's never happened to anybody before and has never happened since. Um, but I mean, for me, it's like, just for the sake of that, don't overcomplicate it. You know, like it would have worked quite simply with a simple animation and then they turned off or even I would have been totally happy with text, you know, like debug text on screen or in the world that basically when I turn around says, this is blocked with rubble and I need to smash it out. Like, sure, it's nicer having the physicalized thing, 
but it's nicer for me to read the text and be able to see what's behind the wall than yeah basically so that's a great one there's uh one of the lads that i i was working with for a, a tomb raider level he did a really nice thing of he's got that great mechanic right of the you shoot the bow with the uh the rope attached and you can shimmy across <laughs> right and he obviously yeah. didn't have the animations but what he did was is if you entered a trigger and then shot your bow from there it would like just turn on the the rope mesh there or just a white cylinder as he'd used it mm -hmm. and then when that was there it just had a much bigger collision so players could walk across it but it worked like i got what the intent was from it it was a little bit funny for us to watch but like that's fine because that's just part of the process you don't need to get like we said everything perfect just showing the design intent as you said mate will and being simple about it still gets the idea across yeah absolutely and Let's be honest. If you know, if I mean, we're talking mostly about level design here. So, like, if you can make mechanics and features to like high prototype quality, then amazing. Like, you know, that's only going to benefit you. But you're you're not going to be judged on you know tiny little yeah things like that if it doesn't look perfect. As long as as long as it shows the intention and it works is is the most important part. Like it. As I said, I would rather something actually has you know like text in the screen, or basically or on screen or in the world that basically covers what the intention is, and you're moving around to explain it, than you know something basically is meant to work properly and then doesn't, and then it basically yeah. sets an even worse representation. No, exactly, and that this is the most exciting exciting thing for for us is to see you just create. With, I mean, yes, there, there's limitations in terms of like you don't have the mechanics that you may want to use in, in the game that you're basing your level in, but it's exciting for us because you're using your, you, you don't necessarily have the same rules that we've created for ourselves, right? Like after a while, you create best practices for your level design team after a while. And so that's exciting as well. So we love to see those things. So yeah, like Ross said, don't be, don't be limited by it. Awesome. I've just seen the time, mate. Like we're an hour, <laughs> we're an hour <laughs> into this. So uh, I need to skedaddle. But it's been an absolute blast having you here, mate. We'll get you on for another one for sure because we could for sure talk about this. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's all day. I mean, I, I could talk about this all day. I mean, there's a thousand things you could talk about. I mean, I guess that's the thing about design, right? Is there's, there's no end of topics. Yes. So. And also, like you said, how you design doesn't need to be the same as anyone else. That's also super important. Like, yeah. you know, there and, isn't a one way. And then that's actually something I would love to obviously discuss another time is um, like across the different companies I've worked at, you know, the design and the way levels have been designed is so different. Um, and that's just as a kind of finishing point actually on the portfolio is everything that um, like if you can tailor your portfolio or even you know, remotely to the places you're applying, which admittedly can be difficult if, you know, you're applying to several to just try and secure a job. Um, that also goes a long way because people often look at a portfolio and they, they look at how that applies to the current place so that they want to be able to imagine the role that they want you for, mm. not just, you know, because you can make something that looks completely different. <clears throat> yeah. Agreed, mate. Completely agreed. Awesome. Well, mate, if people want to get in contact with you to pick your brain more, where can they do so, buddy? Um, so I guess my um, Twitter is always a good one. Like that's obviously where I guess we talk the most and yep. I speak to a lot of other people. So it's just uh, Scourged Wolf, uh, Scourged underscore Wolf. And like I said, we can obviously put a link to it in the uh, in the show. So. For sure. And do you want to mention, we spoke about the uh, the mentoring. Do you want to mention that as well, mate? Um, sure. I mean, I don't know if you want to kind of talk a bit more about it, I guess, with your... Um, because it, it's ultimately your is it starting next month oh sorry i thought you meant the, the, the i meant i was referring to the thing that you and tommy uh oh sorry yeah so, sorry sorry no so um yeah that, that was just something that um basically again like with the the example of um the student well the ex student that i've kind of put the portfolio to is um yeah we what we tend to do is recently because of obviously how awesome tommy norberg is um, yeah like you know the, there's no shortage of uh talent coming out of that university and i think mm. 
just because of the the quality of, of the work like it has actually encouraged us as a company to kind of actively try to work with that university a lot more and try to build a relationship to actually get internships um and i suppose a, a thing on that in general is like i mean ju- just kind of say as well like we at, um cig we do actually pay our interns like we don't expect people to work for free Brilliant. which no nobody should no but like like don't it, it might sound great but like i said you know trying if anyone is looking for internships um please try and find somewhere that pays like because in all honesty like you can tell that you're not less likely to be taken advantage of then um and again don't be afraid to ask like again like by default most people if not all companies will say no but if you have a really strong portfolio and you know you're worried about having you know you're not good enough for a design job or they don't have a design job for the sake of you know asking and having a decent portfolio they may go this person actually looks awesome like let's let's bring them in as an intern you know I, like well you know you'll still get paid and so, so, like with us as i said we actually um had the two we had two interns from uh, the game assembly last year on who were obviously uh, tommy's kind of students originally mm. and basically after their six months because they were so awesome at the job we just promoted them straight to level designers. Like we didn't even, we just skipped out the junior role altogether because we were like, well, they've effectively been doing a junior role for the last six months and they've been yeah. killing it. So, um, you know, like trying to find an internship is also, you know, a valid thing, um, mm-hmm. but just don't let companies take advantage of, of you for free work. And um, again, it sometimes it could be, a way in you know when there isn't an opportunity there so you know, don't, don't be put off if most places say no like yeah. if you keep trying it's, it's always a possibility i think awesome yeah completely agree mate so yeah that's going to wrap it on up for us if you want to reach out to me you can do so on twitter which is at max pairs if you email into the show that is level design lobby at gmail.com and if you want to support the show then please head over to patreon.com forward slash level design lobby thank you very much for listening take care and we'll catch you all next time